local lawyer in town said to me, I haven't seen you online lately. What are you, gold bricking? I went, you be quiet. We have a good team here. I can take a week off. So thank you for Chuck and Charlie and Sheila for covering the weeks that we were away. It's been a very busy summer, something very untypical. Kids got married, you know, um, we got away for a little bit, and God's word continued to go out, and so that's awesome. I get to bring us back to the core values this week under the title that they have ears, you know, these things. They have ears. We're going to talk about one of our core values today, and our text is Matthew chapter 19, verses 14, or verse 14. We are... Some of you may wonder, why, why go back to these core values? Well, you know, what I think is important for all of us as individuals, but I also think it's true of us as an organization, is that we would know ourselves. You see, coming to church is more than just coming, planting your tuchus in the pew, getting your groove on, and then turning around and leaving. The church is a living and a breathing organism. It is made out of living and breathing people. And sometimes, you know, with regard to our lives, Satan is very good at getting us off track, isn't he? He's very good at putting just small, subtle things into our lives to get us to lose our focus in a small way, and then the small ways become bigger and bigger and bigger, and soon we really don't know where we're going. And so ultimately what we want to do in coming back to core values, when writing core values, writing core values is like having the GPS, We know that if we follow the instructions, we'll get where we need to go. But coming to the idea of knowing ourselves, there's a couple quotes I'll throw at you just as a way of expressing why this is important to we as 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 a group to know ourself. One quote said, what is important is that you see yourself, you understand yourself, and you know yourself. Well, why? Aristotle put it this way, knowing yourself is the beginning of wisdom. If you don't know yourself, how can you be wise? This final quote came from Auguste Comte, who said, knowing yourself or know yourself to improve yourself. And so it's important. And so we took this time, Chuck and Sheila and Charlie and myself, we spent time this summer reminding the church of why we are here. We spent time going over these core values for the church These were things that a couple years back our board of administration studied on, we prayed about, we saw where the Free Methodist Church was at, and we wanted to make a more definitive effort to line ourselves coming out of COVID with the church who we believe we needed to be. Not necessarily the church who we were, but the church who God wants us to be now. And you don't throw away one to get the other, you build upon the one to have the other. So in the end, you know, the Bible says it this way. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And so we go to core values because they unite us. They guide the journey, but they also reveal to us when at times we step off course. So thus returning to them is like going back to the step-by-step guide directions. Even though you may have done something a hundred times, sometimes you just forget a step. Anybody understand what I'm saying? You know, get a little bit of that over 50 fog that I'm starting to experience, right? And you you have to go back and you have to have a refreshing. And so we'll bring you to core value number nine today. And core value number nine says it this way, that we believe that every person, every person, every person has the right to hear the gospel presented at a level where they can grow and they can attain it. And you'll see some corresponding scriptures. And again, in your bulletin, there is a follow sheet if you want to follow along. But uh, you'll see these scriptures listed there as well. Because these aren't just our opinions. This is the word of God. So typically speaking, if I were to talk of this message out, I would talk about the importance for youth ministry or children's ministry or different care ministry or food ministries, which are all important. But there are people who might write them off as irrelevant but we didn't when we put these core values together. We believe that this church should stand with and for those who have a need that goes beyond preaching and teaching. Are you following me? 
This is excellent. But this is only the means to get people where God wants them to go. All the other ministries add to that as well, too. So it's not one is better than the other. It's all of them working together. Bring people together where God wants them to go. And we make that effort even if it costs us something. And we make that effort, and this is specifically important, we make that effort knowing that there are people that we will touch who right now, they can give nothing back. So this core value suggests that the church should reach out to those people who can give nothing back. That's what Jesus did. Jesus reached out to people who did nothing for his popularity of his ministry. He saw a need. He reached out to the need. The Free Methodist Church historically. I remember again when I joined the Free Methodist Church. I went to places there were Free Methodist Churches in western Pennsylvania. And though I grew up in Steeler country and it's still the greatest football ever. Little plug. All right. Um, I went to communities I'd never heard from of, of before, though I'd lived in Western Pennsylvania all my life. And historically, what the Free Methodist Church that did that was powerful in that day is it said, we don't have to put a church on Main Street. We don't have to attract a particular economic base. We're going to love poor people, and we're going to let God supply what our needs are. That's what historic Free Methodism did. That's what Jesus did. That's what this core value emphasized that we reach those who right now can give nothing back. So I'll start by asking this question. Don't answer, just think about it. Who does not deserve to hear the message of Jesus Christ? Did you hear that part where I said, don't answer this question? <laughs> I'm just teasing you, Karina. All right. But when you think about it, he already knows. He's probably more aware than the than, than majority of people, all right? Most of us are going to sit here and say, Aaron, that's a crazy question. Everybody deserves to hear the message of Jesus Christ. We will say it, but yet, there's some things that I've heard over 30 years of being a pastor. And if you've said this, don't put up your hand. Don't acknowledge it. I, don't, I just want you to hear some of the things that I've heard in 30 years of being a pastor. And this focus is on who deserves to hear the gospel. Are you ready? Hmm. Here's one I heard. I can't be in a church that would vote for Donald Trump. Heard that. Also heard, I can't believe any Christian would vote Democrat. It gets worse. In having a conversation one time in a church planning committee, someone said, we should plant churches in communities where there are more people who give than take. After all, that's where the money comes from. I'll still go. I was in a church. Someone came to me and said, don't black people have their own churches to go to? I don't want our church going that way, Pastor. What way is that? A little further. Pastor Aaron, you know that gay people have no business in the church, right? Interesting. Do you think Jesus would shun them? Pastor Aaron, you've got to focus on old people. Old people have money. They'll keep the bills paid. So break out that blue hymn book because that's the way you're going to keep it happening. And then there's another crowd. Throw that hymn book away. We've got to focus on young people because young people keep the church young and we build the church for tomorrow. So we need a worship service of hymns and young people need to learn them. I wonder how God feels. Let me flip that over just to be fair. And the younger people say, put the hymn book away. These old people need to get with the times. <laughs> Told you, don't you? 
I'm only bringing, look, look, everybody, you know, I get it. But I want you to think about what you're actually saying. Are you actually, by actions, by words in this case, saying that person doesn't deserve what I've received? And if that's the case, ooh, is that where we should be? I wonder how God feels about statements like this that diminish one part of his children to elevate another part. Probably not real happy. Now you might look at it and go, that is not me, Pastor Aaron. You're preaching to the people in, on that side of the church. Right? I know what some of you might be thinking. Ouch. Yet, I know that most of you, you're probably more in agreement with this slide. That's not me, and you're probably right. People who say these things, they're probably more of the outliers in churches. I mean, most people here, I'm so stinking proud of you folks. What I love about this church is that you guys make people feel at home when they come and, and make them feel apart very quickly. And I hope you know that is such a rarity, and it's beautiful to watch here. Most people, they're never going to say the things that I just shared with you with their lips, but, you know, might they say it with their actions? Might they say, I don't want those kind of people here, not so much with their mouth, but by what they do. And you might think that's strange, but it's really not that difficult. And we'll go to Matthew 19 to kind of get a picture of what doing this by your actions could look like. See, in Matthew 19, Jesus is teaching. And there's something about what Jesus is doing that's drawing the little kids to him. One of my fondest memories growing up in a church was that there was a pastor, and this was about a 600-member church that I was in as a boy. There was a pastor that before church and after church left his office door open. And I was probably about six years old at that time. But I knew you could go to Pastor Volpe's office, sit on the leather chair in his office, and eat a lollipop. And you might think, why does that matter? Every lollipop I I got connected me with my pastor. It made me feel valuable. It made me feel like I mattered. And see, here is Jesus who is out there teaching. And these little kids are like, whoa, he's cool. And they want to connect with Jesus. And they're coming up to him and they're like, oh, Jesus, pick me up. Maybe they're grabbing hold of one foot. He's trying to shake them off. And, you know, maybe he's just connecting with them. And the disciples are looking at this and they're going, what do we do? And the Bible actually says that the disciples rebuked those children. And to put it in context, to understand what rebuke means in the Greek, it means, who do you think that you are? Who do you think that you are? to be interfering with what Jesus is doing? Who do you think you are to think that you should get Jesus' attention? And I love what Jesus does in this because he sees what the disciples are doing and he doesn't stop playing with kids. But he uses this as a teaching moment. And he turns to the disciples and he says this, what we've written on the screen, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. What was he saying? I'm not interested in your politics. I'm not interested in simply giving my attention to people who can further my ministry. You see, I'm here because the heart these little kids represent is the heart that you need in order to accept me correctly. So, you know, there's things about kids. They have to be taught to be afraid. They have to be taught to be racist. They have to be taught to push people away from them. You put two little kids in a room and give them a ball, they're usually happy, aren't they? Right? So Jesus is showing us through this story that he is interested in not simply those who could promote him. He's interested in the least of these, the ones that other people would push away. And when the disciples rebuked them and said, who do you think you are? Jesus said, you're worth everything. Everybody deserves to hear the gospel presented at a level that they can receive it. Even the ones who can give nothing back. So Jesus defies the norms. 
And he chooses to speak worth and value over these children. It wasn't typical in that world. In that world, if you were a teacher, you were followed first by men, but only by people who could promote you. But Jesus looked and said, these little children, I'm going to connect with them. I'm going to love them. I'm going to promote their best interest. Very interesting. Because then he does it again a little bit later on in John chapter 8, 10 and 11, but a whole different context. In John chapter 8, 10 and 11, the Pharisees are out there and they're going, we're going to get him. And I don't quite know how this works out. I don't quite know if they had somebody who was spying on somebody else or whatever. But the story says they catch a woman in the act of adultery. And they pull her out of her bed and they drag her whatever way you want to see this in your mind, before Jesus, what we can conclude for sure is she is completely and totally humiliated, totally exposed to the public, totally at a place where if she could crawl under a pew and hide, that's where she would want to be right now. She gets drugged before Jesus, but I want you to take notice of Jesus' approach. We'll look here in verse 10 and 11. It says, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. She said, Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now finish the text. Go and leave your life of sin. Now why is this important? That woman who was dragged before Jesus, she knew what she had been doing. Nobody had to stand over her and remind her. Nobody had to grab the real heavy Bible and come and whap her a few times just to get it through. She knew she was broken. She knew she was vulnerable and exposed. There was nothing that was going to be said about her situation that beaten and naked she did not understand at that point. She knew she was deeply involved in sin. But note what Jesus did. Actually, let's, let's note what he didn't do. Jesus doesn't come to her and go, rise thou sinful woman. Your mother would be so proud of you right now. No. He doesn't rush to proclaim the truth over her. He doesn't join with people who accused her. He loved her by not exposing her. And it's interesting what Jesus did. The woman is down on the ground as you see there. Jesus doesn't turn to her directly. He doesn't address what she's got going on. You see, there's a bigger sin that's occurring than what she's doing. A bigger sin than adultery? Absolutely. You see, because there was a lot of proud people that drug this woman out of her bed, wanted to use her as an example, and Jesus was more interested in putting his hands in the dirt and writing something that exposed the pride of every man that drug her out in front of Jesus that day. Now, people will speculate, what did he write? Somebody said to me, I bet you he wrote the name of all their girlfriends. I don't know if that's the case. But I guess I want to kind of put this in your minds this morning. If you were deeply passionate about using a person in order to get what you want, and somebody got down and wrote in the dirt, you'd be really interested in what they were writing, wouldn't you? And the Bible actually says in this text that these guys dropped the rocks and split. It said starting with the older ones. So the ones who knew a little bit better saw what Jesus was writing there and went, this is no longer worth it for me. And just were kind of like, well, um, let's put the kids up in front. Huh? And we'll just kind of back out and back away. So Jesus turns the attention, can I say it again, maybe to the greater sin? Focused it on these people that were using this woman to, her, to their advantage. He writes in the dirt, and when they were gone, then he speaks to her. And again, look at what he says. He doesn't say, you tramp, look at what you've done. He doesn't say, do you know that in the Bible it condemns what you're doing? I mean, Jesus could have said anything he wanted. He's Jesus. He could have exposed her, made her feel bad, rebuked her like the disciples had done with the children. But look at what he did. 
There's no rebuke. There's only grace. It's a grace that didn't say, you stand down there and you listen to everything I have to tell you because you're going to hear it from me. It was a grace that picked her up, that allowed her to look at him eye to eye and said, I don't condemn you. I'm not here today to tell you that you're wrong. See, you already know that you're wrong. I'm here to tell you today that there's more for you than this. There's more for you than this. Again, a lot of people want to stop there and they want to go, oh, that's great. But look at the last words Jesus says because it's so important. Jesus doesn't sit here and go, just go back to doing what you're doing. He says, no, I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to love you. I'm going to to give you hope. I'm going to let you look at me eye to eye. I'm going to let you know that there's a love that is free from condemnation. But get out of your habits of sin. Go be different. Go change things. So there's no rebuke. There's simply grace. A grace that lifts her up. A grace that allows her to stand. And the lesson is this, if you turn from your sin, you're not going to be put back into this place again. I don't see Jesus ever saying, believe in me. Jesus gave her one instruction, quit putting yourself in this hole. Your life can be different. He defies the norms and he chooses to speak value and worth over this woman despite her sin. Again, if anyone had the right to rebuke her, it was Jesus but he valued her instead. And I think to myself, well, what if Jesus had done differently? What if he had brushed her off? What if he had attacked her? I think we would have missed out on seeing the beauty of what his message truly was that Paul declares in the book of Romans as he says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He then goes further on to say, but God demonstrated his love for us. In while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So here's a living picture of a woman who deserved the rap. But Jesus went, no, I love you even though you're in this position. We see these verses, they're being lived out in this story. And might I go as far to say that we should see these verses, please hear me on this, lived out every week in the confines of, of the Robinson Free Methodist Church. That someone can come in here completely broken and be received by people who would say, I love you. I value you. I'm standing with you. I'm giving you the grace that I have received. This house should be a house where brokenness turns to healing. I love the stories. Because in each one of these stories, with the children and with this woman, Jesus lifts people who other people would diminish. And you know what the essence of the word is? Be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. If people have ears to hear, we should be, how can I word this? His voice to them. We should make it easy for them to hear. We should lead by example, denying ourselves and taking up our cross and following him. Let me bring my thoughts home as we wrap up. And it'll be quick, Zoe. Jesus made it clear, all are welcome. Everybody. Everyone is welcome. Jesus made it clear that his ministry wasn't for well people, but it was for the sick. In Luke 5, 31 and 32, Jesus said, who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? I'm inviting outsiders, not insiders. An invitation to a changed life, changed inside and out. Can I remind all of us that we all come sick? Nobody comes to Jesus and goes, hey, look at what I'm bringing to you. Not a single person. We need to remember that the church is a hospital, not a social club. It's a place for healing and then a place to release. It's not a place that's about my comfort or my security. This is the place where we are called to be healers. That's our job, not just the pastor's. You see, as we come into this place, our wounds are healed. They're treated, 
And then we're told, go out and be a healer in the way that you have received healing. See, I want you to see it this way. I want you to see that we have to extend grace to people regardless what disease they bring in with them. I want you to look at the hospital, excuse me, the church, as kind of like a teaching hospital. We have been called to pay forward the grace that we are given. And so that requires discipleship. We could say almost like a a medical training. That requires people who have been here longer, who have been a part of healing others, to continue to educate and to encourage. It requires the scripture. It requires the spirit. It requires this, an understanding. And here we go. Your story might be a part of someone else's healing. What you have faced and what God has become in you might just be his very tool in changing your world. It's interesting that the picture is one of a wounded healer. And I want to read this slide. I I realize it's a little bit small here, but I want to define what a wounded healer actually means. It says, no one escapes being wounded. We are all wounded people, whether physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. The main question is not how can we hide our wounds so we don't be embarrassed, but how can we put our woundedness in the service of others? When our wounds cease to be a source of shame and become a source of healing, we have become wounded healers. When our wounds cease to be a source of shame and become a source of healing, we become wounded healers. Again, let me say it, you have a story because your story is God's tool. Your story shows God's healing from pain. Your story shows your life as an offering. Your story is used by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And you might be like, well, that's a choice, isn't it? Oh, no, that's a calling. That's part of why God saved you. That is why it's so important that people who come into the body of Christ are never turned away or never diminished but because of how they come. Jesus never rebuked the ignorant sinner. But he had a lot to say about people who were in rebellion. People who live in woundedness and don't allow God to heal them, Sometimes they can be a cancer to the church, and I'm not referring to those people as I talk about this. What I'm referring to specifically is people who are broken by their immersion into sin. The ones that God is revealing himself to. The ones that he's showing himself to, even ever so so slowly, but they're changing as a direct result of the leading of the Holy Spirit. I love that God is using this body in this community. I love how God is using us, his church. He is using his word. He is using the Holy Spirit to make a profound difference in lives, just like we witnessed last week as David told his story. Had people in this church not reached out and been the hands and feet of Jesus, David Barnes wouldn't have changed. But it's because of a community effort that we now are able to send David into a new community and he could be God's hands and feet there. I mean, think about it. What would have happened differently if David, when he sat over there last Easter, had had nobody talk to him, had had nobody reach his most basic of needs? What would have happened differently? I'm going to close this verse, or this this with a consideration, with a verse, I'm sorry. I want to give you this verse for your consideration. Matthew 10, 7 and 8 says, As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. For those of you who have been in the church in a long time, you know, you may remember the simple choruses of the 60s and 70s. But there was one that I thought was very appropriate, and if you don't know it, I'm going to teach it to you this morning as a way of just bringing this thing home. And it simply says, freely, freely you have received, freely, freely give. Go in my name, and because you've believed, others may know that I live. How many have ever heard this before? A couple of you? 
Well, then you can help me. Are you ready? Freely, freely, you have received. Freely, freely give. Go in my name and because you believe, others will know that I live. You're getting good at it. Freely, freely, you have received. Freely, freely give. Go in my name, and because you believe, others will know that I live. That doesn't require a Bible scholar. That requires somebody who's willing to let their story be the hands and feet of Jesus to someone else. 